skin hunger and the, the importance of healthy touch. Uh, even in the Bible, it talks about having a holy kiss. And then it talks about feet washing. You know, feet washing is a gift that uh, <clears throat> people can give each other. Uh, I used to do a wellness uh, weekend uh, for women, and we would end it by a foot washing, everyone washing each other's feet. Uh, and I think that was the highlight of the weekend. Uh, so it's... Uh, I'm sure all of you know the studies, there's been over 600 in-depth studies given about <clears throat> the importance of healthy touch. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure you also know about the uh, research that was done. <clears throat> I don't know that it was in, intentional research or as it was the result of, uh, you know, during the war there was an orphanage and it was... Uh, sort of built in the round and the nurse's station was in the center and there was babies, babies all around. And the babies over close to the nurse's station thrived, the ones farther away because the nurses didn't get to them in a timely manner to do as much nurturing uh, as they did to the ones uh, closer to the nurse's station because they could hear them crying first. And that's where we got the uh, failure to thrive syndrome. That, you know, babies, <clears throat> from the moment they're born, even little preemies, uh, need that healthy touch from people who love them dearly. So uh, we, we know that, that that is, uh, you know, just basic humans, that uh, human need that we all have. Uh, and, you know, the skin is the largest uh, organ that we have, and, you know, healthy touch <clears throat> helps us uh, physically and mentally. Without it, we can break down in, you know, physical and mental uh, illnesses. I mean, research has shown it over and over and over and over and over. Uh, you know, and the elderly. Where's Jackie? She's not on here. I'm missing some of our regulars. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, the elderly need touch. Uh, you know, they have even uh, been known, you know, uh, nice uh, senior homes, nursing homes, have hired people to come in just to have some healthy touch with their patients uh, or their, uh, you know, people that are there in nursing homes. You know, if they have no family or if the family is out of town, out of state, uh, they thrive better, they live longer if they have that healthy touch. So we all need it, bottom line, we all need it. Do you all agree? You need healthy touch to survive. And for survivors of childhood sexual abuse, uh, this is all a part <coughs> of uh, re-entering the human race that, you know, we have to learn what healthy touch is and uh, and how to set healthy boundaries. And we, we teach a lot about boundaries, but boundaries, is uh, it's not a barricade. It's not necessarily to keep everyone away from us. It's to have some discernment uh, who you let touch you and who you don't. It's up to you. Uh, and I would encourage you to be uh, willing to let some of those barriers down, you know, wouldn't stay so closed off, you know, setting a healthy boundary. Uh, that we miss out on a lot of, of human touch. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, what the human touch does, and we've seen it and heard it, and we see it all the time, it reduces stress and blood pressure uh, almost immediately. A hug will, br will bring that blood pressure down and the stress down immediately. We've seen that over and over. And <clears throat> that one of the things that I used to do in the intensives, back in about 20 years ago, <clears throat> there, was this, there was a lot of work going on and uh, different, it was probably 25 years ago, a lot of uh, pe uh, people that had was sexually abused, people that had uh, come out of cults, uh, I mean, for whatever reason, it was, I mean, they were coming out of everywhere. And so treatment centers were doing a lot of uh, addiction or, or abuse uh, treatment, sexual abuse treatment. 
And then, you know, there was people who would come back later and try to sue them for, you know, touching them inappropriate, whatever. Some of that, I'm sure, went on in treatment centers. But what it did, I think it was about 25 years ago, it shut all the touching down <laughs> from any therapist, any social worker, any, I mean, anywhere. They shut it down. Uh, and some licensing uh, facilities uh, put it in their licensing. <clears throat> and I had dear friends, some of the best in the nation, I mean, known internationally, to give up their PhDs and go to pastoral counseling where they could touch their clients in a healthy way. Not in an abusive way, but in a healthy way. You know, the feeling of a hug, the feeling of a touch of the hand. And for a while, we were told no touching at all whatsoever to clients. Zero touching. <clears throat> and uh, I don't always mind, never have, probably never will. Uh, but, you know, I do an intensive. and used to a six-day intensive, still do an intensive. Uh, and I used to work with a lot of survivors uh, and other people that were wounded deeply, deeply, deeply. And at the end of their work, and I, had, I do not do this with all clients, I never have done it with all clients, but it is a real God deal. If I feel that, <clears throat> that that person has been so deprived of touch, particularly from a healthy mother or a healthy dad, what I do, I've been known to, is rock them. I'll sit, sit down on the floor with them, put them beside me, put them on the right side, have them to lean over heart to heart, and I hold them. And then have the other uh, participants to come by and give them affirmations while we have music on. And one of the times that I've done that, <clears throat> I've never seen it fail. I mean, I've held big old football players, I mean, businessmen, old, I don't want to say old ladies, but anyway, elderly people, I mean, you name it, it doesn't matter. The pain is the same when they have been deprived as children of healthy touch. And I've had them to break down and when they can get into that real deep cathartic crying, you know that that's what you needed to do was just to hold them uh, heart to heart, heart to hearts. <clears throat> and many years ago, we had a... Uh, young man that was killed in a car wreck. And he had an eight-month-old son. And that eight-month-old son, he knew, he knew on a certain level that his father was no longer there. He could not stop crying. He could not eat. He could not sleep. The grandparents, everyone was trying to help him. Finally, it was recommended by our clinical director to <clears throat> for the grandfather to take his shirt off, take the shirt off of the baby, hold that baby skin to skin over that grandfather's heart. And when he did that, the baby stopped crying. And so they worked that in, in a, a daily routine, a daily routine. That man's grown today. I'm, I, I'm, I'm interesting to know if, you know, I mean, I think it went on until I knew until he was at least six years old, not probably without, you know, clothes, but that heart to heart embrace. Uh, to hear the heartbeat of another person helps you know that you're alive. So, like I said, the, I wanted to wait until Jackie came on, but anyway, and I see Jackie here. Uh, anyway, speaking of the elderly, the elderly need touch. And uh, I know all of y'all can keep a secret, and so I'm going to give you a little secret. Uh, I have a new friend in my life, and it happens to be a man. A man friend, and this woman didn't think I'd ever, ever want to even have a friend. And that's what he is, is a friend. Uh, but, you know, that male touch is so different, you know, and, you know, just a hug, you know, a touch of the hand. That's what we need. That's what the elderly need, and I go under the category of the elderly. Thank you very much. And so it's just a need that we have that God gave us. So I wanted to wait till Jackie came on before I gave you the secret. Some of y'all don't tell anybody that I have a new friend. My kids, now Cam is far, and Christy's far. Uh, Misty is, uh, you know, pitching down on the floor having a fit, and so is Cam. And... <laughs> Well, now uh, the whole world knows because it's on Facebook. Anyway, now they're going to have to get over themselves. And 
I mean, it's a friend. I'll never, ever, ever get married again. So there you are. I just wanted to give you all the secret, and I know you'll keep it. So anyway. <laughs> it's all over Facebook. <laughs> let's get back to human touch. And, uh, you know, I've already said that there is over 600 scientific, scientific uh papers written on the importance of human touch. Uh, and what it does, it stimulates and release, releases those natural endorphins in our body. And, you know, it affects, like I said, our brain, our mental state, our physical state, everywhere. Uh, and <clears throat> those, when it releases those endorphins, it's called uh, love hormones. Love, you know, y'all felt them when you know, whether it's your child or whether it's your, uh, you know, spouse or a good friend, you just feel different when someone hugs you or touches you in a healthy way. Uh, because of my own sexual abuse, I grew up being a touch me not. And I had a dear sponsor, and she was a dear sponsor and a, uh, really a spiritual guide for me early on, early on, and I'm so grateful for her. And I would scare her to death at times. So we were driving along. She was driving, and uh, she was having me to read some step work for her. And she happened to reach over and touch my arm. And I jerked. It scared me, and I almost jumped out of the car. So that's why you have to be very careful touching <clears throat> incest survivors without their permission. Don't slip up on them, you know. Uh, and because it just instantly brings up that negative feeling. And uh, my husband was so grateful when I went to treatment for 30 days of trauma and really worked on that because then he realized, you know, when he would touch me or even try to come close to me, I mean, I could, it would just be, you know, right? And so that relieved him knowing that it wasn't him. So um, if you have had any form of childhood abuse, and it doesn't have to be sexual, it can be physical, any form of childhood abuse, <clears throat> you must do the work around it. Do that childhood work and do your anger and shame reduction work and bring it up into today. Uh, and so I'll just give a plug for the four day. All of you people know about it, but we do that four day intensive. And that's really what we work on is those, uh, uh, a lot of, not all clients don't do that. Some bring in a specific problem they want to work on, but most of it is working on childhood, some form of childhood trauma, because the childhood trauma can produce the feelings of not wanting to be touched or wanting to touch everybody else. Either way, it works either way. Uh, and so <clears throat> it is, uh, like I said, I keep saying it's a fundamental human development. And I get a little concerned now with, uh, you know, research has shown that students in school, if they are tapped on the shoulder, you know, like the teacher walks by and they tap them on the shoulder, they are three times more likely to speak, stand up and speak in class if they just tap them on the shoulder. You know, I get that teachers can't touch kids at all now, you know. And, we, you know, I hate that we go from all to nothing, you know, all, you know, one extreme to the other. Uh, and also another research showed that people who are waiters or servers, you know, in a restaurant, <clears throat> if they touch the shoulder, you know, just a little touch of the shoulder to the person paying, the, the tip triples. That is how much that connection, that human connection, the difference that it makes. So those are just some little tidbits. And, uh, but you know, now with technology, <clears throat> we have generations growing up that can have friendships, relationships, connections, and never have to see people face to face. Do you all agree with that? Technology is getting between human touch. <clears throat> Uh, and I see this with teenagers, young adults. They live their life right here, right here on the screen, on the telephones. Uh, and it, it makes me wonder, 
Now, I do know, you know, I'm not this stupid. I do know they get together <laughs> eventually, uh, and sometimes too much, but nevertheless, uh, I believe technology has uh, come into play for a lot of us. Uh, you know, the gaming of a woman over 60 years old that came to us in an intensive in Chicago. And she could not go to work as a professor. She could not get her grades in. She couldn't function. She had long-term, and by the way, I have permission to share this. She has long-term recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous, over 30 years of recovery in, in uh, OA. But she couldn't get to work. Her, her husband moved out of the bedroom because all she wanted to do, are y'all ready for this, is play the, one of those little games, one of those little, like, and I don't know anything about it, but this is what she did all the time. It was like building cities or whatever that thing is. It's, but she was addicted to it. Minecraft. When she came to us, she had knots on her wrist up here from constantly, constantly, constantly playing. So she's in good recovery today, and part of her good recovery has been to go back and learn, and what she got with us is that she really had not dealt with the sexual abuse as a child, and therefore she uh, was uh, pretty much uh, not a figure and didn't like to be touched. Uh, and that's what has changed with her. So we're never too old. We're never too old to change. So <clears throat> technology has played a big part. And then let's talk about the big one today, COVID. COVID has, uh, I mean, changed the way we interact with people today. You know, we they say don't shake hands, do elbows. Uh, it's just, uh, it's kind of paralyzed the whole well, the United, I mean, the whole country, <clears throat> that, that there are healthy ways that you can hug your loved ones, that you can be with people. One thing is wear a mask and don't hug anyone that doesn't have a mask or in your family system if all of you are safe and if you've been vaccinated, you know, had the vaccine and you know that you are symptom free, feel free to hug your loved ones. But when you're out at meetings, I don't know, I mean, I haven't been to a face-to-face -face meeting since COVID started, but what I miss the most is that hugging, is that touching, holding hands at the circle, at the end of the meeting, that human touch. <clears throat> and COVID is, uh, uh, I hope it doesn't change the way we interact with people forever. I hope it doesn't last long enough to change the whole you know, affection, attention, you know, the healthy touch uh, forever. But it's, uh, you know, kids coming along now, little kids, they're going to grow up knowing that it's not okay to shake hands or whatever. So COVID has really separated us physically, I think, more than anything or anything that I've ever experienced. Now, I did grow up during the polio epidemic. We couldn't go to school, we couldn't go to the grocery store, we couldn't get outside the house. And that was a time, I mean, it was lonely. It was lonely uh, until we got the vaccine. And when it, we did, there was mile long lines. People, I mean, it was children that was getting the vaccine because it saved their lives. It saved us from, and that's how the vaccines are gonna be today. But anyway, I'm not gonna get into that. Uh, and then let's talk about couples and healthy touch. Couples need affection and healthy touch that doesn't always lead to sex. You know the book, His Needs, Her Needs. <clears throat> Men and women are different. Men and women are made different. Men and women's needs are different. And when I say this, I'm not talking about every man because I don't know all men. But basically in, that, in the book, and it's a top seller, and if you're a couple and you've never read it, I, I support you in getting it. It's called His Needs, Her Needs. And men need different things than women do. The top, there's five things that men need and women need. I'm not gonna go over all of them, I'll go over a few of them. The top one on men's list is sex. That's how they're made, that's how their brain works, and that's how they feel love, is through sex. 
you go over here with women's experiences, you know. I mean, what it makes for most women to feel loved, and that is romance, hand holding, you know. And it, I used to love to work with men. I had a private practice, a small private practice years ago of men when this book first came out, and I'd have them read that. And they would only come to me after she had already filed for divorce, and this was the last thing, you know, she, he, they would just come to my office because she threatened him, you know, I am going to go through with this divorce if you don't go see Tenny. Uh, and I love teaching men how to treat women. If you can teach men how to treat a woman, now I'm not saying all that it's your, all, you know, it's all the man's fault, it's not. But if you can teach a man how to treat a woman, women are responders and they respond to love and touch, healthy touch, that doesn't always lead to sex. And I will tell you guys, if you will, you know, have that healthy touch in the kitchen, you know, sex needs to start in the kitchen. And I don't mean you have sex on the kitchen table, or if you want to, you can, but anyway. It starts by knowing someone. I mean, pay, acting like you are acquainted with them. Speak to them of the, of the morning. Hug them, kiss them before you leave uh, to go to work. Do the same when you come in. Pay attention to your wife in other ways except through sex. And if you'll do that, I will promise you, you'll get more sex than you can handle. So just with that, I'll go on to the next thing. Try it if you guys are out there. I don't have a lot of guys on here, but you can spread the word. Uh, because women are responders, and women love to hand hug. They love to be romanced. So, you guys, that's just a little bit of a tidbit there. Uh, so, what else I was going to say is about, like I said, the decline. And, uh, <clears throat> and another reason that there's so much decline in touching, physical touching. You know, from your doctor, from your dentist. Uh, I went to a wonderful dentist for many years. Uh, and my children, I mean, I kept telling them, you know, my, <clears throat> we are paying for this carpet in here because my, you know, I, I took my children on a regular basis. He was a beloved man. And what he would do to calm those children down is he would touch them right, right here, right here like that, just a, just a soft touch. And they loved and adored him. And of course, you know, on the way out, they got a little trinket, you know, I got to go to the box and get it. At the, but uh, uh, Dr. Bill passed away, to, Dr. Bill, uh, Bill Pierce, passed away about a month ago. And it saddened me because he made such a difference in children, teaching children that it's okay to go to the dentist. Uh, doctors, healthy physicians, uh, have been known to touch their patients in a safe way. And now people are afraid to touch anyone, you know, because, and I will say, of the sexual harassment in the office, the sexual harassment in colleges, you go down the list, there's been everywhere, you know. Uh, and so because of that, uh, People are afraid to touch anyone hardly, you know, particularly in, uh, as a professional for fear of being sued. So there's got to be a happy medium somewhere. And uh, so I'm hoping after COVID that we can get some healthy touch back into all of our society. And, uh, you know, the shaking of hands, even holding hands, that palm to palm, uh, is to remind us, <clears throat> I mean, it gives us such an emotional, uh, powerful feeling, palm to palm, your palm to someone else's palm. Imagine that. Uh, and so we do teach boundaries here. Boundaries are important. <clears throat> I used to be a hugger, 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 hugger. After, when I got into Al-Anon, you know, I went from being so bashful and shy, I could not say my name in Al-Anon meetings. And then I got to say my name, and then I found my voice a little bit, and then I started hugging. And I would hug everybody whether you wanted to be hugged or not. Not everyone wants to be hugged. And so we set boundaries here, teach people to set boundaries. Now, if you're around somebody that you're not, 
close to or you don't know real well, if you want a hug or think they may, you know, think they might want, if, if you want to give them a hug, ask their permission. Ask their permission. Are you up for a hug or would you like a hug? I still do that with my grandchildren because it is, uh, I don't need to transgress their boundaries. And uh, so boundaries are important, but the, you know, I started out earlier about barriers. Barriers can keep you from having any contact with another human being. And so it's uh, really, really important to, uh, another thing about boundaries, you negotiate them. Uh, people that, uh, like Misty, and my and sponsors, my adult children, uh, a lot of you on here, we've negotiated. When we meet, see each other, we're going to hug. That's what we do. That is negotiate. You don't have to ne negotiate that every time. Now, if you meet up somewhere at a conference or something, and you're having a bad day, and you're in the process, and you don't want to be hugged, just say, not right now, I'll come back for, a, you know, that's setting that healthy boundary. <clears throat> uh, but negotiate with your family. Like, I'm going to use Misty for instance. Misty has given me more healthy touch probably than any human being I have ever known. Uh, she hugs me, she touches me, she pats me on the face. I mean, and I love that. I eat it up. Uh, and I scratch her back, she scratches my back, and you know, it just, if she'll come by and maybe gets four, five, six hugs a day. And I don't know, it's filling up a place in my heart that hadn't been filled for eight years since Ariel passed away. You know, I finally taught him when we married. I mean, that man did not know how to be affectionate to a woman. And you've heard the story that I had to teach him how to love me by sitting in his lap and literally teaching him how to hold me you know, and hold my hand and all, and he was a good student and he learned. And so for the last 20 years, we had a wonderful marriage and he did the hand holding, he did all of that, which he did in the first 30 years. Uh, and I stayed anyway, but anyway, I'm glad I did today. So healthy touch is good, but that needs to be negotiated. And if it changes, renegotiate it. Uh, so let's see, Virginia sits here was the grandmother of family therapy, and uh, I've trained with her, uh, the woman that was that she trained. She actually, it's, uh, I can't think of her name, Sharon, Sharon Weissinger Cruz. I trained with her on several occasions up at uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. And a lot of the work that we do here, I uh, was taught by Sharon, who was taught by the master Virginia Satir. And when you work under Sharon, uh, or did, or when I trained under her, uh, we hadn't didn't know about all this not hugging stuff and all of that. I mean, this was uh, over 30 years ago. And uh, what Virginia Satir taught her, now this, uh, this was not scientific information. This came from uh, Virginia Satir, like I said, the grandmother of family therapy. She said we need four hugs a day for survival. Four hugs a day for survival. And we need eight hugs a day for maintenance. And then if you really want to grow, get you 12 hugs a day. Now this was before COVID, so, uh, but I love that, you know, uh, Virginia Satir, and I I think of her so much. I've never had the privilege of meeting her, but every time I do an intensive, I think of, of Virginia Satir. She went into it, uh, the business to love people through their hurt and pain. And, uh, you know, I've had to make amends to a lot of my former clients because I used to be a rager, and I raged the clients years ago. And if any of you are on here and I did that to you, well, make my, I make my amends. I don't do that anymore. God literally removed the rage from my brain. Uh, and, you know, I can get angry. I very seldom do, but I, I can. Uh, and so, like I said, I had to go back and make lots of amends. But basically, when I get inside, particularly an intensive, I can be confronted, but the thing that I go in there with I pray before I go in there and 
ask God to lead and direct everything that we do in there. And but what I attempt to do is to help give some unconditional positive regard and love to those clients. Some of them haven't had it for years. Now, like I said, you know, I'm not a softy. I don't go in there and just love them to death. Uh, but what I do is I hope that I, the work that I do uh, is with grace and uh, truth, honesty, and, uh, you know, and then a lot of love. And then at the end of every time we work with a client, I ask them at the end, would you like a hug? And most of them say yes, and they'll, and then that's when I know whether they, they need to be rocked or not, because if they have just are just breaking down, and just you know, I'll just get them on the floor and hold them and rock them. And I have some music that's it's a a, a little uh, childhood song that a lullaby song we put on. All I have to do is look at Kim. She puts the music on, and you know, then I have people come around and give affirmations to the client. And I get letters from people all the time from years ago that said that was the thing that turned your life around. And that took a few minutes, a few moments. Uh, I don't do that as much anymore. I still do uh, some. <clears throat> uh, but another thing, after they do their work and they get feedback, I have everyone stand up and I ask the client, are you up for hugs? And if they are, the you know, I mean, here comes all the other clients and they just want to hug on them and love mm -hmm. on them because they have witnessed their pain. They have witnessed their pain. They have witnessed their struggle by listening to their life now. And so they are connected. They get that heart connection. And so uh, very few, I don't guess I have, I mean, I haven't had anyone in a long time that refused the hugs. They can hardly wait to get them. So... That's what I have on human touch, healthy human touch, and the need of it. Uh, and I hope you've gotten something out of it. And, uh, you know, if you live alone, there's ways to, you know, to get around. Used to, we'd go to meetings and we'd just get all the hugs we, you know, could stand. I mean, which, you know... It, but even there, I think it's important to ask newcomers, particularly if they're up for a hug, don't assume that they want one. Uh, but now that, you know, people are, are shut in, I'd like to hear, what do you do to replace that human touch? If you live alone, or if you are a touch me not, or whatever you want to share about the human touch and how essential it is from birth till death. I'll tell you this, y'all have known the struggle that I had with my mother. And uh, I loved my mother dearly. I mean, I was obsessed with my mother, trying to get her well. She was like my child, all of that. But through recovery, you know, I could set a boundary with her, and I, I would no longer take her verbal abuse, which she abused me up to the day before she died, verbally. But in spite of that, I would go to the nursing home to see her, and I would take a bottle of lotion, and I would just rub lotion on her arms and her legs and her feet while she was cussing me out and, and telling me why I wasn't doing this right and that right. And stuff. But I didn't do it for my mother. I didn't do it for my mother. I did it for I could feel good about myself. And to demonstrate uh, in front of my children and grandchildren what it's like to love people in spite of themselves. Uh, and, you know, I got, I'm sure, much more out of that than, than the, my mother did. But I, on a certain level, I know she loved it because she was a, a deprived child growing up. She had, had no mother. So, anyway, that's what I have. Who would like to speak up? And if you don't, I'll call them Sarah. We'll start with Sarah. Come on, Sarah. Talk to us. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah.